Francis. All right, could I have your attention, please? <coughs> it's class time. Oh. <laughs> well, welcome to uh, Senior College and this class on the history of the Bouchard family farm. You know, my name is Don Raymond, and I'm on the board of directors for the St. John Valley Senior College. As you know, <coughs> Fort Kent is celebrating its 150th year of incorporation this year. And uh, Senior College has been offering a number of classes on the history of certain Fort Kent institutions. <coughs> like we just recently had a, a class on the early history of Fort Kent. We've had one of the Fort Kent Lions Club, and we've had one on the Fort Kent Fire Department. But tonight we have a special one. Um, this is a, a history of probably the oldest farm that's still in operation in the town of Fort Kent. The Bouchard family farm started somewhere around the, 18, the early 1800s and continues today. And um, we're especially pleased to have Mr. Alvin Bouchard, who's here to tell us about the farm. So, Mr. Bouchard, the audience is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Don. I'm not here to tell you why we're still on the farm. It's not because we're better farmers than anybody else. It's because we diversified and we didn't let the lows bring us down. When you're low, you can always step higher, don't step back, step higher. And that's what we did. I've done and we've done all our, all our lives. I want to tell you a little about the lineage of, of my ancestors. This is Charles Bouchard, and he came in the country from Quebec in, in the 1830s. He came in because he heard that the United States, not the United States, America, was a better place to live than being in the hands of the French. He didn't like the French at all. So we heard about the uh, Acadians when they were deported from uh, Nova Scotia. So he came to see the Acadians. He came and settled in St. Louis. And he thought he could buy a farm and uh, start uh, raising crop and raising his family. But apparently there was it was so crowded in this little village that uh, he thought that the hopes of getting land was practically nil. So he jumped in his cruise ship <laughs> and he motored up the, uh, the St. John, the uh, St. John, yes. And then he stopped somewhere around the golf course. And there he started raising his family, had all his family with him. But there again, land was scarce to get because way out in the back was the mountains and in front of him was the water. So he decided, let's try another, another river. There is another river, let's try another one. So he motored up, motored, <laughs> up the Fish River. Well, lo and behold, when he came to the falls, there was no way he could paddle up the falls. So he decided, let's try our luck here. So there is a brook that uh, leaves somewhere at the end of the runway of the airport and flows below the falls. So they followed that brook because really when they wanted to uh, squatter, they needed water. So they had to get close to water. 
in that brook was a, a source of water. And when they landed on the, when they came up to the uh, on land, which was about where the the uh, runaway is, the airport. And they started squatting. They squatted there for a number of years. And then after a while, the land agent from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts was sent to alleviate these, uh, these uh, squatters. And if they weren't liable to stay there for a number of years, build a home, and that they would have to move. But apparently these people wanted to settle there and raise a family, raise their family, and uh, cleared land. So that's what happened to Charles. Well, Charles had a a bunch of boys. I think he had uh, eight or nine boys. They had big families then. Twenty and eighteen people were not <laughs> just as common as today's family of one and sometimes only one and a half. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> he said he uh, built a home I don't know how the hell they built it. I don't know how the hell they cleared land. Because I know the problem in clearing land. When you come into a, a virgin forest, there's trees about, I'm not saying that there was trees about it this big, but I've seen trees about this big in virgin land. How long do you think it would take to tear it apart and haul it out with one horse. It's practically impossible. So, but that's what he did. I don't think that where he came to shore that the, the trees were as thick as a virgin forest. But still, there were trees in there and they had to clear it. They had pulled the roots out and uh, I did a good job because they were still there uh, 20 years later. And uh, 20 years later, uh, the land agent went back to find out if they had done their duties. Seeing that they had done their duties, they offered him another Actually, I'm, I think I'm going to go home and rest. <laughs> <laughs> no, he had, apparently he had done a good job, and he wanted more land. And the only land that the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which owned the area then, would allot them 20 rods wide and a three quarters of a mile long. Why? I don't know, but I think I know. They wanted the people to come in and sell the area. So uh, then this child asked for another lot. And he was, he was uh, approved for another lot. So now he had two lots. And in 1867, he was issued a deed by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So now he was home and it was his. Uh, Did they have to pay money at all or it was just deeded to them and as long as they followed the rules? It was deeded to them because they wanted the people to come in and settle. There, there was not too many people around here and they wanted people to come in, so that's why that they, and they gave him a 330 feet wide, which is uh, 20 rods, which they were 
I love it. And three quarters of a mile long, I know the reason for three quarters of a mile. Because the road from the river then was three quarters of a mile from where they were stationed. So all the lots that were allotted were that size. Then he had a, a son that he allotted in one of his lot, which is Israel. And Israel is my great great grandfather. So we're getting close. <laughs> uh, and how they earned a living, I still don't know. They couldn't go to the store and buy a loaf of bread and cereal for breakfast. They had to farm with what they could get. And apparently, uh, buckwheat was growing wild in these places. And I don't know if the Indians told them that it was good good eating material or somebody else. But they grew buckwheat, they grew some oats, and then they hunted. So uh, that's the way that they uh, sustained themselves. And they, they, didn't, they couldn't sell any, people, any of these crops. But they traded, they bothered with most, mostly their neighbors or... And these guys had to go to town. Town was incorporated then, and, uh, but it was a, a big job going to town with a horse and to the woods. And <clears throat> So uh, I want to show you the, a picture that uh, I had. Uh, see, this is the type of lots that they were allotted. You can see that they're all about the same size. And then <clears throat> the only road that they had was what they called the Ramsey Road. That Ramsey Road was uh, Leaving the, uh, right here, the 161, and it was going straight up the hill, and it was hooked on to the, uh, the road that goes to... Uh, New Canada? Yeah, New Canada. There. And it came from Salt to Paul. There was a road then. So that, that's the way they went up to, to town. So these, and we were about here where the, our ancestors landed on this side of the river. So that, that was three quarters of a mile and they had early Ross wine. <laughs> This is, this is where the, our farm is, where Joe lives. And the road here, that's the 161, it has been re, remodeled or revamped. Before that, it came straight up here. And that's Joe's potato house. And it, you can notice where the, the, the road to Jones Road is. Went through the swamp. It was straight. That's the Ramsey Road. That's the Ramsey Road? That's the Ramsey Road, right? That's the Ramsey Road. That's the Ramsey Road. That's the Ramsey Road, That's the Ramsey road. <laughs> yes. The strip road was not there. No, there was no strip road there. It was just a path. They claim it was a deer path <laughs> that day. So that's... Uh, that's where the, the Bouchard came from, and that's where we came from. And uh, this is my grandfather. 
he was a product of uh, Israel. <laughs> anyway, they, they, he did the same thing as his ancestors. But then we had a railroad that came in. And they were mostly growing potatoes as far as I know then. So that opened the market for potatoes so they could haul their potatoes to the, to the markets too. That is my father. He took over the farm in, oh, I would say in 20, I would say 20, in the late 20s anyway. But he was, he went and farmed, bought the, farm, the St. John farm. This was a, a sizable farm, and uh, he farmed there, and that's where I came in. I came in. I it, it, this is this is uh, odd, but it's still a thing where people stored their potatoes. This is a, a dwelling, and they stored their potatoes. In the, in, in the cellar. And sometimes they could put a thousand barrels, I don't know how big their cellar was, but I remember when I was young, my father stored potatoes in the cellar that we were. We were. So uh, I know that it, that for a fact. <coughs> and this is the one schoolhouse. That I went to school. Which is located right across from the house. Yes. Right? Yes. And didn't you burn it down? <laughs> <laughs> when, you was in, was, when you was in school or after you graduated? <laughs> and all the children that were in school, see, this is uh, maybe one day. Eleven of them were Bouchards. <laughs> so you can just see that uh, the Bouchards dominated the area. Are you in that picture, Pat? Yes. Are you up in the back? I won't tell you. <laughs> Are you up in the back? Second one in? Yeah. yeah. It looks just like William. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <This> Joker. <laughs> so that comes to me. Well. I'm sorry to say I didn't do too much in my life. <laughs> but we had about 500 acres then. Uh, it was not all crop land. Maybe it was about half and half, maybe 200, 250 acres that we had. And uh, we grew potatoes and grain. My father had cattle, a few chickens, and the buckwheat, well, the buckwheat then we didn't grow too much. We grew only what we could process and use for ourselves. And uh, if you could grow a, a barrel of buckwheat in the fall, you would have all the flour you need for yourself all winter long. So that's the amount of buckwheat that we grew then. Now it's a different story. So, uh, <coughs> by uh, 52, 52, it was in 48 that my father bought his 48 when he bought his first tractor from P.B. Roy, bought his first tractor. And uh, we farmed until, uh, oh, 1948, uh, 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 I think, when I had to do a little stretch in, in the service. So I did my stretch. Came back, 
didn't they didn't stay there long they couldn't hold me <laughs> pen wasn't big enough so when I came back I said well we'll have to diversify we'll have to do something to diversify because potatoes got to be a point that this year you sell your potatoes at uh, a good profit the next two years you'd lose money so there was a limit to losing money every year sometimes so uh, I thought I'd, I'd grow some uh, some turkeys I've got to tell, <coughs> tell you a little something how I started in politics I got a because I, I was a little politician in my days. <coughs> First off, I was nine years at, as a town councilman in Fort Kent. And when I got out of there, I joined an agricultural uh, uh, business that uh, helped the farmers in the, in the area, in the, in the United States to uh, accomplish something to hold the soil on their land. Like uh, diversions, waterways, uh, and that, uh, I was appointed to that for the county. And uh, being appointed to that for the county, I met quite a few people and people influential sometimes and uh, uh, they talked to me in raising turkeys well nothing wrong in raising turkeys so first year I got myself 50, day, 50 turkeys did well on that sold my turkeys didn't feed my family because I didn't have a big family then. The next year, I grew 500 turkeys. Well, that was a different story because uh, if you know what a turkey is, it holds its name. It's a turkey. <laughs> One day, my turkeys were about 20 pounds, anywhere between 18 and 22 pounds. And uh, apparently somebody scared them or somebody wanted the free turkey. I could never tell. So uh, really they were skitterish like hell. And they crowded and uh, We had a hired girl that was sleeping on the, on the side of the barn. And she came to wake us up. She says, You're, you got some turkeys out. Well, lo and behold, practically all my turkeys were out. There was a, they had great big barn doors then. I'm sure you know what barn doors are. They're 18 feet high and 20 feet wide. They had pushed against that uh, the, uh, the door, and they opened the door. Jeez. Well, he won't do that again. After we put them in, I took some rods and I barricaded the door and put something against the door so they couldn't push it back in. Well, lo and behold, the next morning when I got out, I could see feathers on top of the of the of the side of the the doors. I had a hundred and eighty-six turkeys dead, oh. suffocated. So that was not a good a good thing to do, but I did it. So. That's the story of my of my uh, of my life. After the turkeys, well, I said I'm going to raise chickens, raise hatching eggs. 
So I uh, cut my barn ready. I put three floors in my barn, and I started raising uh, uh, <coughs> hatching eggs. I did well with the uh, hatching eggs, but these uh, the guy that uh, came in for hatching eggs, they were fly-by-night affairs, and in two years, we, we don't want any more eggs. I mean, we, we can't do it anymore. Well, lo and behold, uh, we had to quit. But in my case, they told me to quit when my, my chickens had, were laid out. So they were ready for slaughter, so it didn't hurt me too much. I, I did pretty well then. After that, well, I said, well, I'm going to grow chickens for eggs. So I had a, a little brainstorm, and uh, I built myself a house. My house would ha was uh, holding 12,000 layers. Wow. <laughs> it was uh, uh, 280 feet long. Well, you see it there. 280 feet long and 40 feet wide. And uh, I had them in cages. I did damn well with these, these eggs. Damn well. This is the setup of my uh, Grading, uh, grading eggs. See, all my eggs would come in on underneath the cages, coming on belt. And this is the holding that were coming in. These were going to the uh, a, a grading table. That's the grading table right there. And I had that for. Oh, I had that for a good 10 years until I had a little bad luck. I, uh, I grew my replacement in the barn. I had a great big barn. I grew my replacement in there. And when they were ready to lay, I transferred them to uh, a <coughs> laying house. Well, Lo and behold, telephone woke, woke me up one night and I opened my eyes, I couldn't see a thing because the, the whole house was on fire. My barn was on fire. So uh, <coughs> what happened, I don't know. Anyway, it floored my barn right to the, to the floor. That was quite a loss. That was quite a loss there. I, I built that, uh, that house in 60. That's where I had my chicken, my head layers in there. Where did you get that machinery to put the conveyor belts and everything? Did you make that or? Well, no, no. As far as the grading equipment and the, see I, uh, I picked some, some days when the, the house was full of uh, layers. I picked anywhere between 12 and 1,300 eggs a day. Thousand yeah, eggs, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So that was a sizable breakfast. Where did you sell them? Where did you sell them, Paul? Well, that's a, a big story. <laughs> uh, I've been lucky in selling my eggs because then there was a lot of uh, uh, lumber operations. And uh, really and honestly, I didn't, I sold all of my eggs to the lumber operations and to the stores around here, around the valley. And uh, I never lost an egg except when I dropped it. <laughs> then we have to go to harvesters. Oh. He doesn't want to go late. I can't change him. 
That's a big one. Yeah, the last time uh, I, I grew maybe a hundred and uh, anywhere between uh, uh, 180 to 225 acres of potatoes in my lifetime when I was really harvesting potatoes. And uh, last year I had 85 peppers and it took me five weeks to, to pick my crop. So uh, that was too much. It was getting to a point where the hand pickers were hard to get. So uh, I thought, well, harvesters were coming up then. I thought, well, I think I'm going to go to a harvest to harvesters. So in uh, I don't know, I think it was 60, 65, 64, 65, that I went to a harvester's. And uh, <clears throat> I had uh, one harvester, but I grew too much potatoes in that year for a harvester. And I had a hand crew to pick potatoes besides my harvest. But in three weeks time, I could harvest my crop. When with hand pickers, I'd have to go five weeks. So it's getting to a point when uh, you don't know what's going to happen in the fall. Then that, uh, that was a combine. It was, uh, I, I think that was the, I bought a combine in, uh, in, from P.B. Roy, I bought a combine, it was eight feet wide, cut eight feet wide, and uh, I think I paid eight hundred dollars for it, <laughs> and I used it uh, four or five years. And then, well, we brought, we grouped some more uh, grain and people wanted me to go cut grain because I was the only one who had the combine, so I was in great demand. So I, I, I bought another one and uh, that one was, uh, that one was 14 foot wide. It was a great big machine and uh, I, did pretty well with that, but that, that didn't help me much because I was neglecting my work when I had to drive that. <coughs> then when Joe, Joe showed up, I let him drive the combine. But he wasn't getting enough grain, so I kicked him out. <laughs> 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 uh, I grew sugar bees for three years. That was some place in Canada that we went to look at the sugar beets. I did well with sugar beets, but. Uh, Lo oh, and behold, the guy who processed the sugar beets didn't do so well. So he left, he left us high and dry in two years. So we had bought machinery and so we lost a lot of money. I mean, the county lost a lot of money with people like that around. <clears throat> so that was uh, one part of my life. Where were the sugar beets brought to the process after it was harvested? The uh, sugar beets were brought to Easton. In Easton, uh, they had that. Uh, they were supposed to have a, a great big plant there. That's the potato blockade.
we had problems with the Canadian, the Canadian uh, imports. And uh, the Canadians were subsidized quite heavily from, from, from their, uh, their government. And uh, we couldn't get any subsidies at all. So they were coming in uh, left and right with their potatoes on our market and we couldn't sell ours and they sold theirs at a low price because they were subsidized and we were not. So we put a hell of a fight there. We blocked it in eight ports in, the, in, the, in Maine. And that's a no-no, you know, when anybody's book, but we did it. And uh, I think we lasted three days. Nobody would cross the borders. So that went nationwide for a while. We had a little altercation in, uh, in Holton. Uh, Holton, they wanted to open the border in Holton. So we sent reinforcement to Holton. Well, reinforcement or not, we had some law laws in, 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 uh, in Holton too. We had officers there we had to deal with. And it came into a, a fist fight. Ooh. And uh, one, of, one of our fellows had to go to the hospital because he was hit with a, a belly from one of the officers. So, uh, but we held on for three days. And then they promised us the moon, but we only got the shadow. <laughs> <laughs> That's my involvement in the batting shed. We had a batting shed here in town, and we needed a batting shed. We need storage for potatoes. So uh, <clears throat> I made quite a few trips to Washington there to talk to a few, a few delegates and finally after two or three years we were allotted nine hundred thousand dollars to build a packing build a packing chain and uh, we did it I think we did a good job the town gave us the the land and uh, we did a good job, and it, it done it done us well. But in the meantime, we had a few farmers that were not involved in this, and we were hurting them because we were packing our potatoes, and these farmers could not pack their potatoes because we had all the potatoes that. The, uh, in, in the area. So they gave us a big problem. Big problem enough that we had to close, close shop. That was, that was a great big blow to us. During the 80s, the, the uh, potato business came practically to a halt. We were selling potatoes for 25 cents a 50 pound that, that, to the farmer. So a lot of farmers went under. A lot of farmers went under. And uh, during that time, I had uh, one daughter who was a nurse then. She was working in the uh, in, uh, in Portland area, hospitals there. And she went on a convention in Louisiana somewhere. And uh, she came back after, I don't know, two weeks, a month, I don't know, maybe two years. <laughs> anyway, she came home and we were all three girls sitting around the table and I was there too. And uh, she came home with a bag of beignets. And they mentioned, why can't we do something like that? 
we know what boys are. Why don't we reintroduce the boys to the to the to the area? Oh, well, that sounded like a good a good idea. So they went along with that. I didn't though. <laughs> I didn't think that was proper, but they, they went along with that. And uh, I'll let Jane here explain how they went about it. Thank you. I won't get confused with my slides because I only have one. <laughs> but I do have to tell you that the next uh, seven or eight slides I prepared for Joe and, and Janice, and they've never seen them. They have no idea what's going to come up here. I just, I just, I gave. They, she gave me a stack of photos and I put them up there. So, anyway, um, that's exactly what happened. What Dad talked about is that we, Claire, had brought up a bag of. Uh, it was a, a mix of banyan mix, and we made it, and we all enjoyed it. We loved it. So we thought, well, then somebody said, well, why don't we do this with ploys? I'm going to go to school over here. So we did. Um, we started out. First of all, we we collected about maybe five or six different recipes from different people because you know there are as many different recipes for ploys as there are people who make them. Everybody makes it a little different. So we wanted to get that recipe that was, that was what that we thought was probably the best and, and you know easiest to, to market. So we did that we did, and then we found our bits, our recipe, then we mixed our ploy mix in a stainless steel bowl. We could only mix it three bags at a time. <laughs> then we purchased some paper bags, the sandwich bags that you get from, you know, paper bags. We double packed them because they were leaking. And we ordered some labels from, I think it was the St. John Valley Times, and we were ready to hit the market. <laughs> so what we did is, this happened in September, we, uh, fall, and at the, the our first debut was at the um, University of Maine Arts and Craft Christmas show here, and we we had we filled our uh, boxes, which were like old cereal boxes and you know diaper boxes. I mean, we didn't, <laughs> and we took it down to the show, and we sold out that first day. Wow! And we were we had a griddle, and we were making samples and buttering for people, and you know it was everybody knew what they were and they said this is so much easier than the way I've been doing it so we decided this was good a good thing and we just kept you know moving ahead uh, we eventually uh, moved out of that our the kitchen and into the, the garage mom and dad's garage we got a mixer and I think I'm not sure where that came from but she brought she brothers. Oh, okay uh, and then we did our first show outside of Fort Kent and we were shocked. Nobody, maybe 10%, maybe 5% of the people had even heard of ploys. I mean, I'm talking caribou, Prescott Island. The only ones that had even heard of ploys or, or recognized them were people who had been to the sporting club. So on the way home that night, I'll never forget, I, I was think, talking to mom and I said, you know what, we, are, we have to make this, we have to make the, an identity for this product. We're not selling another uh, another donut or another. It's something unique, and uh, our, our marketing we are going to have to beef it up <laughs> because we need to uh, get that word out there that this is a, a separate product. And um, so we did it. And I think that we started off with just our regular pour <coughs> mix. Um, then I left town, and Joe and Jan took over, and they've again taken that product that Dad did not think was going to work. <laughs> and they they move forward, they move up forward with it and, and into what it is today and along with other things too and, and Joe will talk about that. Um, well, I guess we're going to start a little bit further back um, when I got out of school back in '86 from Orno. Um, like Dad was saying, in early '80s, farming wasn't the occupation to be in. Uh, farmers were going under pretty quick and uh, he asked me one day the only time he asked he ever asked me he says you want a farm I must have said yes <laughs> <laughs> and he said well if you want it we can make it happen and 
that's kind of what brought us where we are today. Uh, I farmed for two years from uh, 87 and 88. Wasn't good. Uh, 89, I took a break. I went to work for uh, NRCS, Soil Conservation Service. Riding around the valley, uh, Van Buren was, you know, you go to Van Buren often because that was part of the St. John Valley uh, service out of this office. And uh, I was looking at what other farms were working with. You know, some were big farms that had processing growers uh, for McCain. Some were smaller farms that really didn't have much to work with. Uh, equipment, uh, other, uh, other support machinery or storage facilities. And then I looked at what I had, what I kind of gave up. I said, well, I'm going to change that. So the following year, that's when I started in basically, probably 89. Can I say something? <laughs> that year that you didn't farm was probably one of the best yeah, farming years exactly. that they've had in a I, long I time. Try, I try to forget that one. <laughs> but, uh, but that, yeah, I feel bad. That yeah, that year potatoes sold at a price that uh, they hadn't been seen in years. Oh. To make a long story short, we started back, I started back farming, definitely with dad's help, just because I was there taking the, uh, uh, signing the checks doesn't mean he went to Florida. <laughs> so it uh, definitely, he was still active in the business for as long as he could and still is. he still is uh, to to, a, to the extent that he can, you know. Uh, so that, that that brought us to 89, 90, uh, still farming. Northland came into the picture, Northland Frozen Foods. Uh, I was the first grower to contract five acres, five or nine acres of reds with them. And then it took off from there. But uh, they, they used us well, it was close. Easy, easy people to deal with, and they had markets. So, at at one point, I had, I think, I had all my 180 acres processed, uh, grown for Northway. People were saying, "Don't put all your eggs in one basket," but I really didn't have a choice. Table stock market was terrible, uh, and other factors were making it harder to pack potatoes. You know, a lot of uh, government uh, regulations in packing, uh, finding people to pack, uh, you know, those other things. So I just kept my uh, eggs, well, eggs, yeah, potatoes with, uh, for Northland. Um, they went out in probably 95. Due to the Atkins diet? A lot of it was due to the Atkins diet. <coughs> Nobody was eating potatoes anymore. They couldn't sell their processed breads to different stores, so they ended up closing. They had big markets with the airlines, and then that, that time the airlines stopped serving food. food. So that backed them off. Uh, they were, they merged with an outfit in Idaho called Sun Globe. That's where North Sun came into play. And they moved, you know what happens when you merge? One plant or the other wins and the other one loses. So we lost, and they, I think they brought all their markets out in, uh, in Idaho. So that in 95, we decided, I decided to get cattle. Lost Northland, still planted potatoes. Uh, I got cattle in 96, no, oh, when did my pickup get total? Oh, was that yeah, it, it was 2005 that, uh, or 2004 that Northland closed their door. So I got cattle that year. I remember because we had I had cattle that, that escaped one night, one winter, big fiasco. So I'll always remember 2007 when, my, when my pickup got totaled and I had to buy a new one <laughs> because anyway, that, that's a long freaking story. Maybe I'm not going to get to that one. But we've had cattle since selling freezer beef, local market. Um, finding other markets downstate <clears throat> the past couple of years, which has been working well for me. Uh, four or five years ago, I got into the cow-calf business. So now I'm getting probably 20, 25 calves a year, which supports 
the calf, the cows that I sell that are finished, meaning that they're, they're ready for slaughter. Uh, I also have to buy some, but I buy them local at a, at, a, at a farm in Madawaska. So that's been working out well for us. Um, okay, before we get to the store, let's talk about the boys. When you got the mill? Yeah. When you, uh, um, where you used to mill it? When we first started the buckwheat flour business in 83, 84, there was, uh, we weren't milling it ourselves then. Uh, there was a mill, I think we used to go to uh, Cote d'Ivoire across and get our flour. But not long after that, Dad found an individual in uh, Sagus, outside of St. Leonard, over in New Brunswick, that we went there every month or every two months. The business wasn't that big then, with up to 80 barrels. It would take a big day, we'd go there, they'd mill our flour, and then we'd come back. Um, it was taking its toll on our, on our old trucks. Then that mill was sold to another farmer on the other side of St. Leonard over in St. Andre, closer to Grand Falls. So we went, went to mill there. He was doing a very good job, uh, but it was still kind of a pain. It was almost a three-day process. You, had, you load your barrels up the first day, a full day there, full day to go mill, and then coming back was, you know, have to unload everything. So it worked in the volume that we had, that we were working with, but it was still not, we, we saw the, the, the ploys going further. So I don't know how Dad found it, a machinist over in Baker Lake had this old buckwheat mill in the back of his building on pallets covered with an orange tarp. Was he ever going to use it? I probably not, but he had it. How many years did you have it before you actually put it in production? Uh, we, we, we bought it. We bought it. I don't know what you paid for it, but we had it for probably six, seven years before. Uh, in 80, oh, shit, my, my, my ears are getting all mixed up here. Uh, whatever year it was, in late 19, uh, 19, maybe 98, we decided to put up a mill, a building. Talking with Dad and, you know, hey, we're still, you, you, you're still, uh, you can still help me out in putting this together here. So we put up the mill kind of the same a replica of, as the mill that we were going to in uh, just near Grand Falls. It was basically set up the same way, much smaller mill. That mill is, is uh, 14 or 12 inches and the, and the mill in Grand Falls is uh, double that, 24 inches. So we went there, uh, we, like said, we were going there, we built this mill and we started milling our flour. By 2000 we were milling all our flour. I plant about 250 acres of buckwheat. Uh, and that's just about every year that went between two and two fifty, depending on the yield. That's just about what we go through, um, pretty consistently right now. Uh, two years ago, I put in four hundred because my tank was getting low. And looking around with these guys in Canada, not not planting anymore where we used to mill. Uh, where do I go if I run out of buckwheat? It's not like if I run out of barley or oats, I can go to see Edwin Pelletier or the, the other neighbor and, uh, and get what I need. So I, I really had to make sure I had enough supply of raw product to meet the demand. So right now we're going through about 250 acres a year. In terms of bushel, we get uh, you know 50 barrels. Um, Per, uh, 50 bushel an acre, not 50 barrels, 50 bushel an acre is a, is a good average. Uh, normally we get, you know, between 40 and 50 bushel an acre. And I guess how, it depends how on much the year. flour does a bushel? A, a bushel, a bushel which is 48 pounds of raw grain gives me 17 pounds of flour. Mm -hmm. uh, and then That's again, depending on the flour, well the balance is, is, a, is, a buck, is the, the brand which is the pig feed or animal feed, 
and then we have the uh, the hulls, which I use for bedding for my cattle. But, but the it, internet has has been a big thing. I mean, for us, I mean, I don't know how, what year we started with the website, but you know, with Facebook and all these other ways to market it, that's help spread the word and. You know, you put a little something on Facebook, shoot it out, and next thing you know, people are ordering, especially around the holidays. Or So, we've had to evolve and learn different ways to market our product. And if you're not out there, like in, in, their, face. in their faces all the time, next thing you know, it's like, oh, I haven't had ploys in forever. Well, why don't you make them? Oh, they forget about it. Or it ends up in the back of their shop. Ploys. Not the bag there. I think it's been there for two years. Is it still good? A bag of ploys is not like a box cereal. Box cereal, after four or five times you use it, you need new box. Ploys can go a long ways when you're only two people in the family. So you can be using it for a couple of weeks or whatever, and then as soon as you put the salt and pepper shaker in front of it, you might as well put it in the back of the, in the, back of the cupboard. That's why we came up with the cookbook. <laughs> She's always trying to market. She's always trying, trying to, to sell, sell something. No, I mean, this was, I mean, when we first thought of this, Joe's mom and I and my daughter helped design it and stuff. I mean, I was thinking of a, like a little flyer just with a few different recipes and of course it grew and then we wanted the history in there. We wanted how the farm started. We wanted gluten-free recipes, so we have a gluten-free section. We have a French Acadian section for, you know, the Creton, the Beignets, you know, for people away that want to make the old fashioned different foods. Um, you know, different recipes using the ploy mix. So this is just a way for people to not just keep it in their cupboard. Okay, today I'll try making ploy donuts or, or using the buckwheat flour to make all these different gluten free recipes. So just another way to Push the ploys. <laughs> okay, let's get jump back a few. Uh, six, seven years ago, uh, we didn't have enough to do, so we put in some blueberries. <laughs> These ideas always come in the middle of the winter when it's slow. Just like your alpacas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is true. In the winter time, it's a little slower. We're, all we're doing is pushing snow, moving a little bit of potatoes, and milling, and, and that stuff. So we brainstorm what we're going to do in the spring. Well, that little brainstorm. And when that comes in, it's right during planting season. It's like, what were you thinking? <laughs> Springtime. These had to go in in the spring. Let me tell you, it was rough home for a while. Here I am planting. I was planting quite a bit more, more potatoes in. Trying to plant. Well, we got to put these my, blueberries my blueberry in. Blueberry plants are dying. They need to get in there. So, <laughs> you know, this is a whole diversification thing that uh, kind of is a negative about it. Sometimes you do things quick. And, and you don't do it right. And you don't do it right, or it doesn't work out as good as you thought. <laughs> the store has been a really good idea. It's been a really good thing for us. <laughs> it's been a good thing for us. <laughs> it, uh, we used to have our little corner, mini, mini Walmart. Walmart, I call it, across the road, where she had her craft for selling potatoes, and that's basically all that was in there. And pumpkins. And, and pumpkins, and <laughs> one winter like i say ideas come up in the winter time uh we were going to expand that into more of a store there was a, a corn king who was selling animal feeds was going out that year and we were kind of talking so anyway to make a long story short they had they were going out and i bought their inventory uh for feeds and they gave me an idea of what sells and what doesn't and that's basically where we started and then definitely Jen put her fingers in there and that, that's where it is now. We're selling our, our beef there retail. Uh, I got to bring it down to uh, Charleston, just outside of Bangor to get it processed because that's the closest state, federal, state inspected slaughterhouse that allows me to sell it retail. Other than that, I can sell a side of beef. If I go to Frenchville or go see a guy in Stockholm, I can sell a side of beef that way. But to sell it retail, it's got to be, an inspector's got to be there at all times. And that's the closest uh, closest facility. 
So the store helps to sell our other products, whether it's promoting, still promoting the ploys. Um, you know, I thought at one time when we first opened, I'm like, oh, I'll have a ploy bar here. I'll make ploys with different toppings. <coughs> well, you first wanted to do your crafts there, but that didn't work out. I know, it just ran out of room. It, it didn't make it big enough for me. So. It, makes, it, makes, it makes at least, well, twice I expand. But anyway, that's that's just the way it is. Um, that's a place to sell the meat, and then we got the greenhouse. Is there a greenhouse uh, line? Oh yeah, I forgot about the greenhouse. You still got the ploy ice cream sandwiches. I do it's have ploy ice cream sandwiches. Just promoting the ploys again. <laughs> See, there's there's the alpacas that that was another winter winter uh, brainstorm. <laughs> Uh, we put up a no, little building. That was like 10 years ago. Oh yeah, this store. was in her bucket list and it was, you know, it's kind of crude to say, but it was either, the, the alpacas made me a lot of money. It was either, it was either alpacas or a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> so they saved me a lot of money. But look at that face. <laughs> no, they're, they're really sweet. And some people say, but why? And I'm like, yeah. because they're really cute. <laughs> they're cats. They're I still ask that question, why? why? You have? I have six. six. And I will, you know, when we had our petting zoo, we brought them down. I mean, the kids love them. I, I'm like, you might as well have an elephant because nobody gets to see alpacas and feed them. And I just figured with the store, it would bring people there. Kids would love it. And yeah, right now we're in the process of make, building a uh, extension, uh, like a big porch with a little stall at the end, so I can bring them down. <laughs> You're a busy man. <laughs> Go, goes with the territory. Mm -hmm. So you're also going to start knitting with uh, the wool? I do, I'm, I'm I do taking have adult wool. classes. I do have wool for sale, and I'm going to get him working on that this <laughs> No, like I say, it's all... Whatever we have done in the past never many years has all kind of meshed in with the other thing. It's, it's not like we're, we're open... Uh, we're building airplanes here because you know alpacas is part of agriculture the cows uh the store bouchard country store kind of agricultural theme there uh, it's it's all feeds upon itself so it it, it seems to be working anyway um there's a picture of a of a little calf a little escapee escapee it should be on the other side of the fence but <laughs> Didn't like it there that day. Um, oh, there's a put up the greenhouse, a high tunnel. And that was another brainstorm. That was a, that's uh, a lot of work. Brain. Yeah, it is a lot of work. They look so happy. <laughs> Just for the pictures. Yeah, they said smile, and I do what I'm told. Phil doesn't listen. And then there's the big ploy coming up in August. <laughs> Uh, we've been doing that. I'm sure most of you know what's going on about that. Uh, 20, plus hmm? 20 plus years. Yeah, we're over 20 years wow. making the ploy. The, the, uh, I think it was uh, Don that said why we are here compared to all other farms. Uh, I don't think it's we're doing anything, anything special. Uh, other farms have diversified also. Uh, some farms, they're just doing it different. If I would be more into the uh, packing potatoes, things would be definitely different. Uh, maybe we wouldn't have the ploys. We, we brought in the ploys because where the hell are we going to go now? Back in the in the eighties, uh, and that hasn't come very easy to. There was a lot of just you know what? How do we do we continue with the ploys? You know, the, when you're dealing with oh, the whole family, sometimes that can cause. Uh, not necessarily problems, but different opinions, and it, it it that that was tough also. But this is where we are. Uh, did we do anything special? No. Uh, was it a family affair? Hundred uh, percent. Not all the girls are involved, but to me they're especially. What's your name, Jane? <laughs> <laughs> we'll just say they all put their two cents in. They, you know, they all put their two cents in. They're they're all concerned. It's not like they're in, in Cleveland, Anne lives in Cleveland, and it's not like, oh, how's planting going? Or how, you know, it's, it's always in back of their mind, they know what's going on. So, it's and, all, it's and all they good. All, they all help when they can, and they all 
give us advice? It's all good. So, you know, we're not the only... Uh, Whether you want it or not. We can't put the success of Bushard Family mm -hmm. Farm on only one, two, or three people. It's... Everybody. It's the whole ball of wax. Including that guy back there. Hi, Phil. That's the next generation right there. Oh. Yeah. I get, I get Phil. Phil is, is, is the only... Just me and Phil are running basically running the outside of the farm. Jan takes care of the store. And we have a girl who's doing a bang up job, uh, helping us package the flour. Uh, and me and Phil are basically taking care of the outside and you know, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, it, it doesn't matter. Especially with cattle, it really doesn't matter because you have to be there. <coughs> so you know, you put all that together and it's, uh, that's why we're still here. That, that's what you farm for, is not, not for the here and now. Definitely you want to make a living, but it's, hopefully it carries on. If that happens, perfect. If it doesn't, that's just the way it is, that's, that's fine too. I don't want to put any pressure on Phil here, <laughs> by any means. But uh, that's, that's, uh, that's the way it is home anyway. Well, that took care of two hours. It took care of two hours, and they were great two hours. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Joe and Jan, we really appreciate it. And uh, nice to see you.